think what we can definitely all see from the different presentations, even though the frameworks are so different, there are a lot of similarities. And they all seem to be based around caring for the environment, building sustainability and being able to tell their story and gaining trust with the consumers and with people all around the world. Uh, so now if I could ask all of the presenters to turn their cameras back on and hopefully our internet will hold up. Um, we have our first question is for you today, Sam. Um, so we've had a question come through from Anne and she would like um, to know if you could please explain the different purposes of the two mobs of livestock and the outcomes you get from running. So you mentioned in your presentation, running a big mob and a smaller mob first. If you could elaborate on that a little bit for us, please. Yeah, sure. Um, the small mob is our market mob that we draw from uh, each week for, for the markets. So they are selected out of the, the larger mob as a finisher mob, if you like. And so they run as a leader follower. In other words, when we go into a new area that hasn't been grazed for however long, we start to uh, put that small mob in the head and then they get the opportunity to basically just uh, eat the ice cream off the top of the, the paddock. And so you're trying to finish, you're trying to keep their uh, room and function at the highest level and I'm constantly rising nutrition because that really impacts meat quality. So this small group of about 30 or 40 um, steers or heifers uh, get, get to select across a whole paddock area and then it is followed within two or three days by the large mob um, containing all the cows and calves and the animals that aren't selected off and they do the, the more uh, dense grazing on it. And the reason for that is it allows us then to really plan our recovery across the whole farm. We don't have to separate the farm into a distinct area for the small mob. Um, so, so we get much better recovery and then having that density go across the whole land at whatever stages, we get the benefits of that big mob. Um, so yeah, those two factors really. I hope that's enough. No, that's really good. Thanks, Sam. Um, so our next question is for Lynette. We have a question here from John. He'd like to know, will the Rice Girls Promise logo carry the same weight with international customers as say something like a UN Sustainability Goals logo? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think the, um, the, the, the hope is absolutely yes. And I think it's up to us to build trust in that brand. Um, we need to explain what it means. And I think um, Sam, Gillian and Tess all said the same thing. Consumers need to understand what that brand stands for. Um, so provided that we put the work into to really um, explain what that means, then then um, yes, I believe it will. And I think it's the differentiation um, from a, a global, the, the SDGs are really important. And I think we need to remember that we contribute to them, but often it's such a big global um, statement. It's hard to know why that's different coming from Australia or you know what contribution we're making. Does that make sense? Awesome, hopefully that answers John's question. Um, Sam, we've had a follow-up question from Anne. She'd like to know, do you run the sheep with the cattle or do you run them all separately? Um, we run the sheep with the cattle um, and we lamb them with the cattle um, and at present um, we're, we're to extend our um, supply we're actually running the rams leaving the rams with the mob. Now the sheep do tend to separate themselves a little bit from the cattle and often they will not take as much notice of the temporary electric fences as the cattle do um, the cattle are very easy to control that way, sheep not so. So the sheep will sometimes be, um, you know, an area or two behind or maybe in front. But in terms of the overall impact of the mob, that doesn't have much, much bother. Um, and we've found that the sheep do settle down with the cattle. And particularly, um, I think we get some protection for lambing uh, being in with the mob. Um, once the cattle are used to the sheep, there's no issue there. Um, and generally when we move the mob, the cattle uh, will go through 
the gate or opening first and the sheep will just wait. And when the cattle have gone through, the sheep will all follow. So um, it's a work in progress, but it does seem to be functioning well. And the beauty of it is we get two different animals grazing in slightly different ways. And we're able to, again, um, control that, that impact and, 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 um, and get that plant recovery, which is what really drives ecosystem function. Thanks, Sam. Um, Anne has actually commented that that was very well answered. Thank you. Um, so we also have a question for Jill um, related to the ecological outcomes verification system. Um, does the producer pay for the monitoring and the verification or is that covered by land to market? No, producer pays everything as usual. <laughs> uh, they, they get us in every way, don't they, with levies and things. Um, there is a cost. Um, it varies whether you're a um, land uh, a share, share holder, you, know, you pay a shareholding right in the beginning as you become a member. I just can't quite remember what the costs are. I'm sorry, we might have to get back to you on that one. No worries at all. That's okay. We'll have to be able to catch up with you after and get the answers to that one. Um, so I have one for Tess. Um, how does the beef framework um, impact beef producers? How can they engage with the framework? So the engagement process generally runs through um, peak industry councils and state farming organisations. Um, uh, so they're invited to an industry forum, for example. Um, and so the process, we actually use existing industry organisations to feed up into um, our framework and, and via RMAC, the Red Meat Advisory Council. Thanks, Tess. So we have another question here um, about record keeping and for farmers and employees, about what's an easy way obviously with all of these sustainability frameworks we have to take lots of records and farmers need to collect loads of data um, i'm going to open this up to anyone who'd like to answer does your framework have a system an easy way that farmers can tick off their boxes and keep track of their records if they're not particularly good with computers and all of the technology i can start that one if you like um, yep. The EOV actually um, is done for you, so you, you actually participate in the actual measurements. That the recording and the reporting is amazing. It's like like a thirty page document comes back every year, so uh, that's a great way of doing it. And I think it's it's that's what we wanted to give it the power, the it's the grunt that it needs to have this EOV as um, globally effective as it can be is to have that reporting taken out of the exact the landholders' um, hand and having the verifiers come each day. That definitely sounds like it makes it easier. Does anyone else want to comment for their framework? No? That's okay. Um, so we have another question here. Um, I might put this one to you, Tess. How does the beef sustainability framework for smallholder producers who might really have very few cattle numbers how can they engage with the beef sustainability framework? Is there something they can implement on their farm to take part? No, I, I think it's, um, we're, we're a little bit different, but you would have noticed that um, all of the commodity groups in Australia are currently exploring sustainability frameworks. So the dairy industry were very early adopters. The eggs industry have done theirs. We followed very hot on the heels of the dairy industry. Um, sheep sustainability framework should be launched very soon. The grains industry are doing one. Lynette was talking about the rice industry. So, um, but Lynette did identify the challenge that if you're a mixed farmer, as a lot of Australian farmers are, there's the challenge of aligning all of those. But really the industry frameworks are very customer facing documents. Um, so we are gathering data that already exists in industry. Um, we're gathering it from um, the Bureau of Statistics even from um, uh, Meat and Livestock Australia, we do a producer survey 
which has only just closed this week. And that's one, one way that producers can become engaged. But genuinely, generally we don't engage um, too directly with producers, though we do have in our annual update case studies. Um, and that's the story that Lynette was talking about. Um, so it's the story, but again, I, I would emphasise what Lynette's message around story is not enough anymore. Um, I call it, it needs to be verified story. Um, so again, Sam and Gillian were talking about the verification process and how robust that is. So verified story and data to back up is absolutely essential for this. It's no longer enough just to talk about um, this is my farm and these are my cattle and it has to be backed up with data. So I think it's a consistent message with all of our presentations today that the um, verification process and the data collection process is really important for the robustness, the transparency and the trust for these frameworks. And Kimberly, can I just add one thing onto what Tess has said? Is, um, have we got time for that? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess something that maybe I didn't make a point of mentioning with the framework that we're developing, and they're often the case with many of the commodity frameworks that Tess just referred to, one of the objectives, absolutely an objective is to connect with consumer, but one of the objectives is to drive action within the industry. So when the industry comes together and says, we want to achieve, you know, X percent increase in water use efficiency over this much time frame, the framework is intended to, con to communicate that to consumers, probably in a really high level way, but also to, to allow growers to come together and go, okay, yeah, we agree with that goal. And here's what I'm gonna do differently in order to do that. So there will, from our perspective, always be a need to capture data at that grower level in order to make sure that we are meeting that goal that we have set. Um, absolutely trying to make sure that where that data is available in other places, that we can leverage that, um, but you know, hearing Sam talk about the work that that goes in, and 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 Gillian too, that goes into proving, you know, really specific outcomes, it's always going to be a balance, and it's always going to be a challenge, and we've got to find a way to make sure the growers get value, um, <coughs> but that we are also really trusted, because if we if we go out with one story that's not verified properly or is wrong, the trust is really going to get take a hit. Kimberly, yeah. can I make a point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, there's been so many there's been so many care programs around wool care, beef care, cattle care, you know, they just go on and they only, they seem to only have a short period of time of existence. So this is where the EOV is actually making pe people pay for it. And I've just found the cost. So it's about it's $110 the application fee and then it's $990 including GST for the yearly fee. And um become a member of the co-op, you need to buy three shares at $200 as well. Um, I'm not quite sure whether you have to be a shareholder in the company to be an EOB, but I somehow think you don't, you just pay the other fees. But um, there's, I know the national farmers are talking about trying to establish some sort of a sustainable farming pro program on the land. Um, it's, it would be great if they can talk to something like the EOB who's got the verification system already in place. Because the last thing we want is 100 different verification programs around. It's just going to totally confuse the consumer. So it, it would be great if we can all get together with the rice, the, the DRC, the, the grain growers and the beef industry, the sheep industry, et cetera, and work out something that um, can have some robust in it. Um, that is a standard for Australia. It would be a, almost a world first if that can happen. So it'd be nice if, it, if we can all work together with our organisations to make it happen. Yeah, definitely. And I think Lynette touched on that in her presentation as well, that it'd be great if producers as well had just one set of data they needed to collect to make it a bit easier and reduce paperwork. And if we could all work together instead of reinventing the wheel, it definitely has an advantage. Um, I might send this one to you as well, Jill. Um, we've had a question come through. Uh, soil health is a term that's commonly used but rarely defined. Um, whether in terms of land to market and ecological outcome verification program, do you have a clear definition that you work towards for soil health? Uh, personally, I'll talk on my own behalf here. Uh, soil health is the be all and end all. Um, 
the, and I saw building soil. I mean, there's still people in the science world that don't think you can build soil because they have this mineralisation thing in their mind. I think organic matter and carbon can make build soil um, using animals and um, photosynthesis. All those processes help build soil. So I don't, I'm not one of the people that believe that if I snap, sell 500 bales of wool, I'm exporting 500 um, bales of soil. I think that if, I, if I'm exporting that amount of um, produce off the farm, I'm, I should be building as much and more on the farm with the right management practices. Um, so it's the soil health, as I say, be all and end all, is all part of the mineral cycling, the water cycling, the photosynthesis cycling and using the sunshine to make all that function. So at the end of the day, we're processing sunshine and that's our energy force as farmers and landholders. Excellent. Did anyone else have any other things they'd like to add to that? No? Um, yeah, okay. look, I'll, I'll add to yep. that, that uh, we, we consider soil to be a, uh, a living system. So soil is soil and dirt are different things. Um, soil is really uh, uh, dependent on soil life um, because it's the microbes and all the, the all the uh, soil life within the structure of the soil that are able to capture the carbon, turn it into forms of humus that are stable, and also feed our plants in a way that is. Um, that, that is regulated for the plant. Um, so the plants are not forced by any particular fertiliser program. So they draw their nutrient from a balance, sorry, they draw their balanced nutrient from the soil uh, in, in, um, in combination with the soil life. So yeah, I think the fact soil is a living system is probably the main one to get to. Yep, that makes sense. Um, we've had quite a few Absolutely. questions come through initially about um, the financial benefits of taking part in a credential system or if there is a financial benefit to producers. Um, did anyone want to comment on that one? Lynette, maybe if you'd like to start in terms of the yeah, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to start with that because it's a question I understand gets asked a lot and I, I understand it, right, because at the end of the day, as much as we can try and be consistent with the data and things, it is hard, it's difficult, and you can hear it with Sam and she'll talk about the work that goes in, right? It's really difficult. Um, so I think for the way the way that we look at it is that there is a there is a premium for our products at the moment. Many Australian products um, uh, are looked upon as trusted, clean and green, and that premium is really it's special or it's market access or whatever it might be. And fundamentally for us, I, I, I can't guarantee that it's going to go up by doing these things. But what we can do is try and make sure that we can continue to be trusted and continue to be commanding the premium for an Australian product here and in other markets. Um, so so it's, it's not necessarily always a direct, there's going to be ex additional value that's created out of this. But I genuinely think if we don't um, begin to build build these systems in order to be able to answer that question as it gets more and more asked, then we, we, we run the risk of, of losing our really fantastic position that we have right now as the clean, green, trusted producer of an amazing um, set of agricultural products. Yep, that absolutely makes sense. Um, Sam, would you like to talk to land to market? Do you see a cost benefit for producers? Um, Yes, I do. I mean, I see a huge benefit in knowing um, what is happening to the ecology of your soil and, and of the land you're, you're um, managing. Uh, the cost benefit, say it was a $1,000 a year, that is the equivalent of three tonne of loosened hay. Um, so if you're able to understand how your ecology and improve your water cycle minusculely, you will grow far more feed than the three tonnes of loosened hay that it is equivalent cost. So it, it's a case of looking at what is the benefit of setting up a low cost, sustainable biological system um, and and the feedback from EOV can really help you there in understanding what's going on. Um, 
So if you look at it that way, it's very cheap, even if you're not marketing through that system. But just understanding what's happening on your land and how your decisions influence that health. Um, because it's much easier to get the microbes to do the work than to go down and buy the various products you have to do to prop up your plants. So yeah, it's cheap. That makes sense. Um, we've had another question around how sustainability frameworks or how you feel sorry. they might. Sorry, Kimberly, oh, can I talk about the last one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, look, we get asked the same question too. Um, what is the benefit to the producer? Market access, absolutely. Um, our framework, because it's a national framework, um, uh, it's not an on the ground verification or certification system, but how it's used is in trade negotiations, it's used in um, companies. Um, anecdotally, we've got lots of examples of companies looking to access Australian beef who go, well, what are you doing about sustainability? If we can show them via our annual updates with trends over time, what the industry is doing along that continuous improvement path, you can access markets immediately by doing that. So that clean green image that Lynette talked about, you need proof of that. Otherwise we go into, I think it was Gillian's word, it becomes greenwashing. So it's not just the narrative, there's more to it than that. But industries have to prove what they're doing to, to able to access that market. I really like Sam's analogy of, of um, that cost benefit. Um, lots of these practices are quite low cost and you will experience a benefit. Producers are initially reluctant to, to do the measurement because of cost or to change a practice because of cost. But um, my, the example we often use in the framework is the uptake of pain relief, for example. Um, so for many years, producers would say, it's too expensive, um, it slows the whole process down, why would I use that? Those sorts of questions. And now that products are commercially available, um, for aversive animal husbandry practice, if producers are increasingly going, well, I can see the benefit on farm. Um, animals mother up more easily after a, a castration, for example, if pain relief is used. So you can see a production benefit on farm from a lot of these practices that um, we identify as sustainable that um, are just becoming embedded more and more in, in producers on the ground practices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thanks, Tess. Can... Yeah, go for it, Jill. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to answer that question as well. Just from a, I'm basically a commodity producer, being a beef producer. I'm not like Sam, where he's got he's vertically integrated right through to the customer. But the, um, the EOV also, I've got the grass, I do grass fed cattle, I've got EU cattle, and I try and value add as much as I can. But the EOV is another brand that I can attach myself to. But, and I'm also working with Provenir, who's one of the um, relationship customers that Land to Market has. So Provenir come to my property and they're branding Biberinga cattle right through to Harris Farms in the, in the shop. So people can go onto the QR code and see that I'm attached to Provenir, that I'm attached to Land to Market, and they can get all that information right through now again i'm a, I, and i'm a commodity producer and a lot of the a lot of farmers are just that but that is a way that you can link right through a system with eov and land to market awesome thanks jill um we've also had a question come through from michaela she was asking about suitable perennial pastures so they have two large paddocks with heavy that are riverina sand hill on the top and heavy clay underneath and she spoke into a few agronomists and had limited success getting information on what sort of perennial pastures and native grasses would grow um do you have any comments on that i think jill that would be sort of your country is it that was from where i was i'm in the sort of southwest slopes now but i used to be in the riverina so there's lots of natural perennials in the riverina and you just probably need to allow them to express themselves. Um, not again, I'm not sure where the rainfall is, but I was in a 350 mil rainfall when I was out there. 
And if you change your grazing regime and you allow the plants to rest and recover, that you'll be absolutely amazed over time how um, the plant, the natural grasses will come back. But unfortunately, with the management over the last couple of hundred years, we've lost uh, a lot of the perennials aren't available or there, and they were being taken over by annual pastures. So there's the multi-species planting um, opportunity now, and there's Col Scythe, and there's a lot of information in the regenerative world um, on the websites, um, regenerative farming web websites, Facebook pages about um, different species, and there are people putting in. 20, 30 different species in perennial, annual vegetables, all sorts of things, just to kick soil microbes and fungi back into action. Then I think Sam be able to comment on this one too, how his perspective is. Uh, yeah, look, I'd, I'd uh, agree with Jill. I don't really know the area, but um, the general principle would hold true that there would be plants in that area, native plants, native perennials, that once grew there, it may be good to go and look at areas that exhibit those uh, plants nearby, and you could see what uh, perenni perenniality is in the area. Um, if there's no perennials in the component, you've really just got to work with what you've got and gradually shift the community towards the conditions that will allow perennials to come in. Or as Jill expressed, you could start uh, seeding some in on a very low cost basis. But you must remember that plants will only be comfortable in a location when the conditions suit them. And that if you put them into a situation that they're not really ready for, then unless you're willing to prop them up with um, particular fertilizers or changing the conditions, then they'll drop back out of the system. So often you're better working with what you've got and gradually change the Build, build the system up to the point where those plants are comfortable uh, coming into it. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, guys. Um, so we have, this will probably be the last question that's come through from Nigel. It's sort of a two-part question. Um, so he said here, good to hear the examples of increased market access for verification of good practice, but what are the implications of verified poor produce for an individual producer, um, especially if a good product has been turned out, but at the expense of the land's health. And also the second part to this question is, how is that standard communicated to consumers so they can rely on the brand and framework um, credibility? So I know you've sort of touched on that, but would anyone like to have a crack at answering that one? That's a big question. I'll answer one bit of it. You should never produce something unless you're actually building the soil. You just do not want to degrade your soil and your landscape. So whatever you're producing is going to be mindful that you're giving back in tons. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I, I'll just add a comment. I, I think part of the question, and maybe I'm misunderstanding this, is how 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 to if we're doing the right thing, how how do we make sure people are not doing the wrong thing and you know still getting benefit. Um, I think obviously um, what Sam, Sam and Jill were talking about is from a producer perspective, which is so great to hear because at the end of the day, it's about the sustainability of your own farm and benefits that it brings to you. Um, but also you're right, in the short term, there will be people out there saying they're doing good things and they're not. And that's why you know Tessa's point and everybody's point about being really, really clear that we can prove what we're saying and building trust in the brand is so important. Um, because it will come back. I mean, there might be a little blip of greenwashing that's going on, but at some point, people are going to get called out. So we don't want that to be our commodities, and we have to be really committed to the to the data and the verification um, to be able to answer the questions if it get asked. Yeah, absolutely. Did you want to comment on that one, Ted? Yeah, just very quickly. And look, um, your uh, to be honest. Because the world is changing, producers need to become more comfortable with the concept of auditing. I think I'm audited in the, independently by Osmeet several times a year um, and also audited by one of the companies that I supply. So, and to me, it adds some robustness to what I do on farm. Um, 
But interestingly, in, in an evaluation report that was done of our framework um, by some researchers from the University of Queensland, they talked about this concept of calling out, um, which Lynette used that phrase a minute ago, calling in and calling out. So, you know, there are times when industry should call in and address um, issues of poor behaviour, but there are also times when industry should call it out, um, particularly if it's a labelling or a branding issue, um, because, um, and again, this is a consistent message from all the presenters today, you lose trust. Your markets will lose trust in your product and in your production systems um, if it's um, greenwashed or if it's labelled and there's no verification. Um, so all of those, those concepts of trust and transparency and doing what you say you do are really important for this whole process. Yeah, thanks, Tess. Did you want to comment, Sam? We've got one minute to go. <laughs> so. um, yeah, look, I'd, I'd, I'd say those issues of um, uh, trust are central. As a, as a person that markets direct to consumers, um, you know, you, the, you, you can't hide really. Um, and, and it's silly to try and cheat people if the basis of your business is, um, you know, they're in front of you with the customer all the time so uh, I think I think where um, it's not as individual as what we deal with then the robustness of the verification becomes more important so that it's independently assessed uh, what you're doing you know you're not just making it up yourself but but as a direct to um, consumer producer then uh, they're tasting our results each time and um, yeah, it makes no sense at all for us to uh, uh, cheat at, at any point. It's just, it's just silly. Yeah. 